morning. This is VLSI data conversion circuits lecture 20. In the last class, what we saw was what we called a first order delta sigma modulator. The input was denoted as u, the output sequence is denoted as v, the input to the quantizer is denoted by y and we also discussed why this delay makes sense and the motivation for choosing an integrator in the forward path. We said that if we model this quantizer by an additive noise source, then one ends up with what is called the linear model of the first order delta sigma modulator, where instead of the quantizer, you re replace it by an error sequence E, which is added. Everything else remains the same. And we saw that V of Z can be written as STF times U of Z plus NTF times E of Z. This is called the signal transfer function and in this particular case happens to be 1. This represents the transfer function from the noise source which is additive to the output and is called the noise transfer function and is denoted by and in this particular case happens to be 1 minus z inverse. Okay. And uh, as we saw last time 1 minus z inverse represents a high pass transfer function and the DC gain of the high pass transfer function is 0 which means therefore, that the sum of the impulse response terms corresponding to the noise transfer function is 0, because d c gain is 0. We also saw that a fundamental thing is that h of 0 which is the first sample of the impulse response of the noise transfer function is unity and this is regardless of the kind of filtering network that we choose in the forward path. Right? And uh, this is equivalent to say that the NTF evaluated at z equal to infinity. is 1. So, in general we saw that a noise transfer function is basically a high pass filter with the coefficients chosen or scaled so that the NTF evaluated at z equal to infinity is 1. Okay. All right. Now, a couple of minor points I think you must all be aware of this, but I will for, uh, for completeness sake uh, mention this. Uh, please note that in the loop we have been using this symbol for the quantizer right? and if you are to close the loop around the quantizer, it means that the quantities at the input of the summer and the output must all be of the of the same kind you understand so in other words if this is i mean 
if this is an analog quantity right the output is also an analog quantity except that it has got discrete levels okay it is another story that you can now take this sequence which has got discrete levels and code it into a string of digital words with a finite number of bits you understand so as far as we are concerned the, the i mean uh, the quantizer represented by this diagram and when we now enclose this inside a feedback loop essentially can be thought of as a memoryless nonlinearity right with a transfer curve like this in practice how do you think you would be able to, able to implement uh, uh, such a block okay i mean so in in practice what would be done is to i mean there are two parts to this one is to detect where the input lies in that range and generate you know uh, say perhaps a digital word which says the input lies in this bin but that's not good enough the output also needs to be the output needs to be analog correct so you you can't take the digital word and feed it back it doesn't make sense because the input is an analog quantity right so what do you think you will do so you will need not only an analog to digital converter which takes an analog input and generates a digital sequence right which corresponds to which bin the input lies in you need to take that information and generate an analog voltage right so that is what is called a digital to analog converter so this is y and this is v and in the practical implementation this will be y and this will be v this is a digital sequence is this clear so a practical delta sigma loop will look like this the dac will be in the feedback path you will have an integrator here a delay here and an adc okay so this output sequence here is it an anal analog quantity or a digital quantity it's a digital word right except that it's coming out at a much very high sampling rate compared to the Nyquist rate for that input signal bandwidth. Is this clear? Now, this must be shipped off to a digital filter whose job is to <coughs> smoothen out the sequence and I am basically, in principle at least, is a brick wall filter with a bandwidth equal to the equal to pi by over sub. Right? So, all the out of band quantization noise. Please recall that since the noise transfer function is 1 minus z inverse, the quantization noise is shaped away from the signal band. So, this out of band noise will be filtered out or removed by the digital filter and after which you can drop samples. So, this uh, that whole thing as we discussed is called the decimation filter. Okay. Uh, but as far as system studies are concerned, I mean we know that we are going to implement the quantizer uh, as a cascade of an A to D and a D to A converter right and uh, we need to be aware of this, but as far as all system level uh, understanding is concerned, uh, we know what is there in this, in this box. So, we do not have to worry about 
uh, the a to d and d 2 at this point, we just assume that one way or the other there is a nonlinear block whose transfer curve is this step like waveform. And given that we know that there are going to be finite number of levels in the a to d converter, it must follow that this step, this staircase cannot continue from all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. It will saturate beyond a certain point both on the lower side as well as the upper side depending on the number of levels in the quantizer. Is this clear? Okay, great. Now, let us just quickly show you uh, some spectral pictures. The last time we saw a first order So, this is a first order delta sigma or sigma delta modulator output spectrum. This is a simply an oversampled spectrum and a couple of observations. Since quantization is uh, basically a deterministic phenomenon, you should not expect that the spectrum will be you know white or uh, it will be flat, you can see a whole bunch of tones and that makes sense because it is a nonlinear operation, a horribly nonlinear one at that and higher order harmonics will alias back into <coughs> the 0 to f s by 2 band. Therefore, you see a whole bunch of tones sticking up. Okay. And on the same scale, we show the spectrum of a first order delta sigma modulator and that as you can see has got a spectral shape which kind of looks like that. Okay. The key point to note is that in the signal band, this is the input signal mind you, this is the input in both cases with the same amplitude. You can see that within the signal band which is let us say somewhere up to here, you can see that the quantization noise has been shaped out of the signal band. Okay. All right. Now, that we know that feedback can do wonderful things and make a poor quantizer look like a very good one, we now get greedy and say, can we do better? Right? For, with the first order modulator, we saw that doubling the OSR was giving us 1 and a half bits per every doubling of the OSR. So, a natural question to ask is can I do better than this? Right? And uh, I mean, one approach would be, and a straightforward one at that, would be to take a look at the first order modulator and observe that V is nothing but U plus 1 minus z inverse times or rather v of z is u plus 1 minus z inverse times e, where the uppercase letters stand for the z transforms of the respective signals. Correct? All right. So, you can think of this box therefore, as a quantizer <coughs> where the error is, you can think of this as 1 minus z inverse times e. Right? 
right? And we already know how to deal with the situation. What were we doing when we derived the first order modulator? We had a quantizer where the output was When we derived the first order delta sigma modulator, what did we do? What did we have and what, how did we, I mean, what was the model for the quantizer? Pardon? Huh? It is, yeah. So, when we had the first order quantizer, all we had was the output was simply input plus E. Now, instead of the output being input plus E, it is output is input plus some other noise waveform which happens to be 1 minus z inverse into e correct and we had when and when the output was input plus e how did we get rid of or reduce the amount of noise in the signal band by using a negative feedback loop so you can say hey now i can think of the black box or the green box here right as b u plus some error which happens to be 1 minus z inverse times e. So, I can use the same thing that I did earlier that is negative feedback to reduce the error further in the signal band correct and therefore, what I would do would be what did we do the last time around? If you imagine yourself to not see what is there inside the green box right but just treat the green box as output being input plus some error, then what I would do would be to do this and we understand that nothing comes out right away, all right. In other words, the out you cannot have access to the you know the quantized signal right away right so that is modeled by the z inverse and what do we do here now you put a the same thing that we did earlier which is 1 by 1 minus z inverse and this becomes the new So, I am now going to remove this and see if I can make any simplifications of this block diagram and remove any uh, redundancies if possible and what can I do? Pardon? No. What is the most straightforward? E by one replace e by or remove one we may i mean the most straightforward thing you can think of is to notice <coughs> that this signal and this sig signal are the same thing so instead of drawing this this way i would draw this this way is this clear and of course, one can go and find what V is by solving the, the block diagram here, but a lot simpler way of understanding this is to realize the fact that we derived this how this signal say let us call this Y 1 and V are related by what? V 
v is nothing but y1 plus 1 minus z inverse times e right okay which means and how are i mean therefore what how is v related to u when we derived the first order delta sigma modulator all we had was output was nothing but instead of being 1 minus z inverse times c e, it was e correct and once we enclosed this in a first order delta sigma loop what happened to the e it became 1 minus z inverse now the only departure from that is that instead of having e to start off we have 1 minus z inverse times e to begin with so what you must get therefore will be v must be u plus 1 minus z inverse times 1 minus z inverse times e which is 1 minus z inverse square times e correct all right so what is the signal transfer function now is 1 and the noise transfer function is 1 minus z inverse the whole square. So, this corresponds to a second order delta sigma modulator. So, let us quickly verify some of the facts that we are already used to. Uh, expecting. So, the impulse response sequence right N T f is 1 minus z inverse the whole square and h of n is what? h of n the sequence corresponding to the simple response is what? 1 minus 2 and 1. So, sum of h of n must be 0, h of 0 is 1. Okay. And what about the, I mean what do we expect? Should we expect that we are doing much better in band or much worse in band compared to a first order modulator? We expect to do much better because the noise transfer function at low frequency <laughs> is what? Goes as? It goes as omega square. Why? So, z inverse is e to the minus j omega for small omega e to the minus j omega is 1 minus j omega. So, 1 minus z inverse goes as j omega the whole square the magnitude square goes as omega square all right. So, the in band quantization noise is nothing but delta square by 12 pi integral 0 to pi by OSR omega omega to the 4 d omega which is delta square by 12 pi times pi by 1 by 5 times pi by OSR to the power 1, correct. So, OSR going up by 2 x implies in band noise 
power going down by 32, which corresponds to Fifteen dB, or how many bits? Two and a half bits for every doubling of the oversampling ratio. Is this clear? I mean, you must understand, of course, that the assumptions made in the integral are that the NTF goes as omega square that is only true for small omega. Okay. So, as you can see increasing the order of the modulation right, has uh, in fact caused the, the in band sig signal to no quantization noise ratio to increase significantly for large oversampling ratios. Right. In other words this is a, this is a much better high pass filter. Correct. The job of the noise transfer function is to remove or shape away noise from the in band region and that it can only do that if it is a very, very good high pass filter. What is an ideal high pass filter? It is supposed to have 0 magnitude response over a, a small band right? Okay, at, at low frequencies and let through all noise or all signal at at high frequency. Okay, obviously, it is not possible to get make a high pass filter with 0 transmission over a contiguous band and these are all you know for a given order these are all various approximations of making of uh, realizing a high pass filter. So, it is not surprising that with second order you are able to do better than you are with a first order modulator. Is this clear? So, let us take a couple of minutes to see what happens uh, with respect to time domain waveforms. All right. So, one of these uh, uh, graphs corresponds to a first order modulator while another, the other corresponds to the output sequence of a second order modulator. Uh, the red curve in both these graphs uh, it is the input. So, can you tell me which is the first order design and which is the second order design? The less uh, the the one on the left is a first order and this is a second order and why does that make sense? I mean how do you figure this out? So, uh, good. So, the out of band gain or the gain at pi for the first order design is 2, whereas for the second order design is 4. Okay. So, if you plot the noise transfer functions how will the second order noise transfer function look it will look like omega square okay whereas for the first order one will go look like
like this. This is 2, this is 4. When we computed the total noise, not just the in band noise for a first order modulator, what did we compute that to be? Delta square by 12 times sigma h n square, which happens to be 2. This is for the first order. Now, for the second order, what do you expect? One plus four plus one, so it will be three times larger than what you had before. Okay. So you can see that the total noise throughout the signal band, not just within the signal band. Uh, I'm sorry, the total noise over zero to pi, not just within the signal band, is actually much higher in the second order case. Let me also draw your attention to another aspect of these modulators. So, let me draw a more general block diagram now. For example, this, which is also a special case of having L1 and L2 or different transfer functions from the input and the feedback branches. This is the quantizer. This is V, this is Y. So, assuming that the quantizer is linear we can think of this as being an additive noise source E, in which case the output is simply the S T F times U plus N T F times E. And within the signal band, it is very common to make the signal transfer function equal to 1. What did we see in the first and second order cases? We saw that the STF is, is 1 and that corresponds to unity feedback from the output to input. Right? At DC, the gain of the forward amplifier is infinite right? and the feedback gain is 1. So, it follows that at DC, the closed loop gain must be 1, is not it? So, uh, this is a very common thing done. I mean, there is no fundamental reason to make the closed loop gain 1. We could have fed back only a fraction of the output quantity and get, uh, gotten a higher gain, right. But uh, that is usually not done, though it can be done. There is no nothing uh, wrong about it. Uh, so, to keep matters uh, clean, we will just assume that the STF within the signal band or at low frequencies is 1, in which case the output will simply be u plus n t f times e. So, if the output is u plus n t f times e, what happens or what can you say about the input to the quantizer? L of z? Oh uh, well, no. Pardon? Okay, that uh, e into n t f into l of z. Okay, is there a? Uh, can, can you make it even simpler? U minus v into plus e into n t f minus one. Very good, right? So, uh, uh, a simpler way of looking at it is to simply say that y must be u plus n t f of z 
minus 1 times E of z. Correct? I mean, is this clear or is there some doubt? The output of the quantizer is y plus e and that happens to be u plus n t f times e of z. It must follow therefore, that the input to the quantizer must be smaller by e, that is all, correct. Okay. So, therefore, can uh, we conclude anything about, I mean what do we expect the general shape of the spectrum to be? at y. So, you should expect the input to the quantizer to consist of the low frequency input that you are trying to digitize which is u plus some noise like waveform, right, which is basically E of z, which is assumed to be uniform and white and all, all this stuff, shaped by a filter whose frequency response is not or whose uh, z transform is not N T f, but N T f minus 1. Okay. So, in general do you think this, how do you think this will look? How do you think this will look as a function of frequency? Yes? Okay, how will end E of z, I mean if I plot the frequency spectrum of E of z times N T f of z, how will that look like? It will look like high pass shape, from that if you subtract E of z, how will it look? It will also look like a high pass transfer function, of course, now the DC gain will not be 0, okay, but there will be the DC gain will be minus 1, right, but uh, the key point is to observe that at high frequencies there will be still be a, a lot of energy, okay. Is this clear? So, the spectrum at the input of the quantizer will basically look like, you can expect it to look like, uh, like this, where this corresponds to the low frequency signal you are trying to digitize, right, plus some some shape noise. So, this is the input and this is shape noise. Is this clear? Now that we know what to expect, let us take a look at, at spectra at various points. This picture shows the spectral density at the output of a first order and second order uh, modulator designs. So, what do you notice? I mean, this is the input signal is the same in both cases. As you can see, the inband noise component here is much smaller than the first order system. Okay. Of course, I have only plotted it over a small axis, which is why you are not able to see the 
increased order band noise in the second order case, all right. And it is also a good opportunity to take and, uh, and uh, look at the input to the quantizer. Please note that Y stands for the input to the quantizer. And the blue curve here happens to be the modulator input u. And as we expect, the input to the quantizer, do you think it has got discrete levels or it has got continuous levels? It will have continuous levels, right, because u has got continuous levels. You understand? So, the input to the quantizer as you can see can be thought of as some kind of high pass noise which in English means that it has got it wiggles very rapidly okay. and uh, you can see that uh, it is high pass noise riding over the input. Is this clear? All right. So, what can you say about the variance of the noise at the input of the quantizer? Why? is u plus n t f of z minus 1 times e. So, can we comment on the variance of the noise, which is the noise component here? This is the noise component, can we comment on the variance of this noise in both first and second order cases. In the first order case, what is n t f? 1 minus z inverse. So, what is the, uh, what is n t f of z minus 1? z inverse. So, what is the variance of the quantization noise riding over the uh, input signal? It will simply be? n t f minus 1 in this case simply happens to be minus z inverse and whose magnitude is 1, right. So, by, by Parseval, the mean square value of this noise sequence must be delta square by 2. When you have a second order modulator, n t f of z minus 1 is given by minus 2 z inverse c to the minus 2 and this must be. So, what is the variance of the noise? Do the math carefully. It is five, simply 5 times what? Delta square by 12. Is this clear? Okay. All right. So, let us uh, I mean that is basically the variance of this part. Okay. Now, 
let us also spend some time taking at the uh, look at. I also plotted a histogram of y minus u. And what is y minus u? y minus u. Yeah, it is nothing but the histogram of the noise process riding over the input at the at which location? At the input of the quantizer. Correct? This must be a zero mean sequence. Why? Why do you expect it to be 0 mean? Because E of Z, right, which is driving a filter, we can think of this noise process as being generated by taking a 0 mean sequence E of Z, E of n, which is our assumed model for the quantizer and passing it through a filter, which is you know NTF of Z minus 1. Okay. Since E of Z has got 0 mean, you expect the output also to be 0 mean. So, if you plot a histogram, it kind of you know hovers around 0. All right. And uh, well, uh, I mean do you have any comments on the shape? No, no, I mean or rather it is not a trick question or anything, just take a look at it and tell me what you think of. Uh, first of all, it seems to be bounded, correct. So, why do you think that makes sense? Pardon? Which output? And why? E of n is bounded, correct? Filter transfer function does not have a gain. I mean, it has a finite, the gain is not going to infinity anywhere. Correct. So, the filter is stable, correct? The input is bounded because the quantization error is bounded by plus minus delta by 2. So, it indeed makes sense that the the error which is in uh, error, I mean which is the quantization error sequence convolved with a filter whose transfer function is NTF of Z minus 1 must also be bound. You understand? Okay. What else can you notice? So, let me put that down here. Now, your first impressions or rather can you approximate this by some, uh, some distribution that you know. Well, yeah, that is true, right. Uh, so, clearly uh, this cannot be Gaussian because it is bounded, but uh, Gaussian is a nice thing simply because I mean everything that is probably uh, there to understand about a Gaussian process you know has probably been uh, done before, right. I mean uh, people have been working on Gaussian processes and, and this stuff from you know uh, for the past probably 100 years, okay. So, everything you need to know about uh, uh, the Gaussian has probably been discovered. So, if you assume that this is Gaussian, okay, I mean you can now immediately dive into that whole body of knowledge which exists about these processes. Okay. So, it is a convenient assumption to make, right. It is like saying, uh, you know, I mean, some guy lost a ring okay, uh, somewhere at location x and was searching for it in location y, 
right when somebody said uh, what are you doing he said i'm searching for my ring and uh, when asked uh, uh, where did you lose it he says location x then then why are you looking at uh, location y uh, he's uh, just looking at uh, searching location y simply because there's a light there you understand right not because he'll uh, and it's the same thing here right uh, uh, the reason why we assume uh, gaussian is because uh, so much light has been thrown on uh, gaussian and all its properties right and uh, even if that's not exactly right we use it okay i mean this is just a uh, what do you call a small side thing okay so again you know with this fitting stuff i mean you can fit anything to anything so uh, right uh, now the moment i draw this yellow curve i'm sure all of you will say yeah, yeah now it's uh, it looks gaussian you understand right if you look at it from far away anything can be made to look like anything else hmm? anyway it's a convenient uh, assumption all right so in the next class uh, we'll uh, spend a couple of minutes looking at we understand it's bounded and let's try and see what i mean if if we can come up with some upper bound for this uh for the you know the shape noise at the input to the quantizer you understand is this clear that this is bounded okay so then the next question is what are the bounds right that clearly must depend on the magnitude of the input which we know which is e of z and the coefficients of the filter right so in the next class we'll uh, quickly uh, derive a bound for this and that will uh, that will give us also some uh, intuition about what to expect next um, which is i mean so from we've gone from first order to second order we've seen a big improvement in the in band signal to noise ratio so now what is the next step you think it seems like from first order from zeroth order to first order we got a huge improvement from first to second we got a big improvement right so it seems like you can go third order and fourth order and fifth order and you know any order and and basically uh, get infinite resolution right by simply shaping out or making the high pass filter better and better and better and better right and clearly when something sounds too good to be true it probably is too good to be true so you know it turns out that you can't go on doing this because uh, there will be problems in the loop and uh, uh, all this is you know are some observations which will help us understand uh, the phenomenon uh, i mean the phenomenon of instability in the delta sigma loop